The next one on the list is Mark Skousen. No? Yes, give them, give them a hand. Well, it's going to be a hard act to follow, but uh, let me just start by announcing, do you all know the name of the Fiscal Cliff Act that was passed? Have you ever heard of it? It's yeah. called the American Tax Relief Act of 2012. And I believe 99% of Americans are going to be paying more in tax. Now that's a joke. Um, so anyway, my topic is, a funny thing happened on the way to Stockholm, my friendly fights with Nobel Prize winning economists. I am the editor of Forecasts and Strategies. My wife likes to call it foreplay and tragedy. But uh, that's another story. Anyway, I've actually had the experience, as many of you have, attending AEA meetings and traveling the world and meeting many of these fantastic Nobel Prize winning economists. And my favorite story of a Nobel Prize economist is a story about golf, believe it or not. The story is told several years ago that a minister, a lawyer, and a Nobel Prize winning economist went out golfing on Friday morning. And they started off uh, hitting the ball, and uh, after the first round, there was like a 15-minute delay. And by the second round, there was a half-hour delay. And by the ninth hole, there was over two hours of delay. And the minister said, patience, Lord, patience. And the lawyer said, who can I sue? Who can I sue? And the economist is saying, these markets are imperfect. So anyway, they went into the... Uh, to the pro shop and they walked up to the pro and they said what in the heck is happening we have this huge delay oh gentlemen don't you know it's blind golfers day please have some compassion and the minister said oh i feel so bad on sunday i am going to preach a sermon on the importance of compassion and patience and the lawyer said oh, i feel so bad i'm going to write a check for a thousand dollars to the blind golfers association and the economist, the Nobel Prize winning economist, is there in the corner and he's just kind of stroking his beard and he said, wouldn't it be Pareto optimal if the blind golfers played at night? <laughs> so, that's... so, I'd like to start off, uh, one of the things that I have noticed, one of the lessons in life is, how economists are transformed after they receive the Nobel Prize. And I've noticed this. So we will start with the brain before winning the Nobel Prize. As you can see, it is full of compassion, creativity, truth-seeking, and humility. Unfortunately, the brain after winning the Nobel Prize is full of greed, vanity, polemics, and gossip. And I can prove this with a number of examples, which I will now show you. Now, the first Nobel Prize winner that I met with is probably one that none of you recognize, since he's a Nobel laureate in physics for the double helix, James D. Watson. Woo! Yeah. By the way, just by a show of hands, how many of you secretly desire to be a Nobel Prize winner? Just, uh, just curious. <laughs> Less heads. Paul, Paul Krugman, yes. You're raising your hand? You want to win more than one prize? The Peace Prize and the Literature Prize? All right, we shall see. Anyway, I had this very fine meeting with Jim Watson. We were on a personal basis here. And he showed me his latest book. Now, this demonstrates how, how Nobel Prize winners are transformed. This is his latest book, Avoid Boring People. But think about it. Is it a verb or is it an adjective? <laughs> Economists have understanding of subtleties. That's good. That's good. Now, my first encounter with the Nobel Prize winner was Friedrich Hayek. As you can see, I'm a very young man here, wearing, sporting a beard. This is actually in the Austrian Alps. 
And I met uh, Professor Hayek and had a very interesting experience with him. But to tell you this story, I have to go back five years because this took place in 1980. He won the Nobel Prize in 1974. And after he won the Nobel Prize, he, he really became more involved publicly and he gave a number of speeches. And I well remember a speech he gave in 1975. This was a time during the energy crisis, there was all kinds of inflation and so forth, and the dollar was collapsing, etc. And in this speech, Professor Hayek made the following prediction. He said, by 1980, the dollar will be worthless. And I said, wow, that's really an incredible prediction. And I wrote it down. And days went by, weeks went by, years went by, and finally in 1980, I had the opportunity to uh, interview Professor Hayek. And I reminded him of the prediction that he made in 1975 that the dollar would be worthless. I said, we still have the dollar today. What is your explanation? And he said, oh, Mark, you misunderstood what I said. What I really said was in 1980, the dollar would be worth less. <laughs> True story. These guys are very clever. Now, of course, it wouldn't be uh, complete, I would, to tell you uh, some of my encounters with Milton Friedman. And here I am showing him a picture, which I'm about to show you in the next slide. This is, uh, actually, I was the last person to, to meet with Milton Friedman for lunch before he died. And uh, so I consider this a great honor. But I'm showing you this is a rather unshaven Milton Friedman. He had forgot about our uh, luncheon engagement, and uh, his wife Rose told him, get down there, you're supposed to meet with this fellow. So uh, here I am showing him a, uh, a picture, and this is the picture I'm showing him that he's getting quite a kick out of. So this is a picture of two Nobel Prize winners, George Stigler and Milton Friedman of the Chicago School, and then John Kenneth Galbraith. Now, uh, Stigler would be a great person to add to this uh, uh, humor session because he was quite famous for his acid uh, uh, humor. So here's what Stigler said. All great economists are tall. <laughs> there are two exceptions, Milton Friedman and John Kenneth Galbraith. <laughs> That's pretty good. Now I'm going to go back to this picture here because I have to tell you a very funny story uh, that happened when I had lunch with Milton Friedman. This guy was sharp as a tack right up to the time, the day he died. And at this luncheon, which was just a month before he passed away, um, we had a wonderful lunch together for a couple of hours and when it was all through, the bill came and I quickly grabbed it and paid for it. And when the bill, uh, the bill came back and I signed it, I turned to Professor Friedman and I said, now, Dr. Friedman, all my life, I've heard you make the statement, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I am here to tell you that that statement is wrong because I'm paying for yours. And quick as a beat, he said, no, no, Mark, that wasn't a free lunch. I had to listen to you for two hours. <laughs> Well, my, it, this, uh, this little tale of my encounters with Nobel Prize winning economists would not be complete without telling you of my encounters with Professor Paul Krugman. Now, it's a little bit blurry, it's the best I could do. Uh, Krugman is a little bit elusive, he's pretty hard to get a hold of. He's always coming and going and so forth, but anyway, I've had quite a few encounters with Paul Krugman. In fact, as some of you know, I do a conference every year in Las Vegas called Freedom Fest. And uh, we have great debates and we have a mock trial every year. And this year it was, it was going to be Wall Street on trial. And we wanted a representative of Occupy Wall Street to come. And so I approached Paul Krugman. I emailed him, no response. So finally I went through his agent. And uh, his agent said, well, yes, uh, Mr. Kruger would, uh, would love to come. And uh, I said, well, what's the price? Now, uh, understand that he's representing 
the 99% Occupy Wall Street. You know how much he wanted? I asked Paul if he was going to come tonight, and he said no, so I'm going to tell you. A hundred and five thousand dollars. I kid you not. Plus two first class airfare, suite, and a limo to pick him up. Instead, we got Robert Frank from the New York Times for one gold coin plus coach. And it was a bargain. He was great. He did a great job. So you have a chance for Nobel laureate status, in my opinion. Robert. Would you, would you like to stand up and uh, take a bow? <laughs> when you see him. I think he's showing up tomorrow. So anyway, let me tell you one, one quick story about Paul, other than the one I just told you, which I think is a little bit funny, but it is a little bit crude. So, uh, did you know when you win the Nobel Prize, this is really a special occasion. Then a lot of the people who hope to win the Nobel Prize, who stay awake all night waiting for that phone call at 6 in the morning on October 15th. And of course, when it came to Paul Krugman, he was very excited. Rob and his wife was very excited. And as you know, as it is when you win the Nobel Prize, you get a little bit of a swelled head, as I pointed out with the brain. Well, that's not the only thing that swells up when you win the Nobel Prize. And that evening, they were planning to celebrate. And so there, as they were lying in bed, Paul was aroused. And he went into the bathroom to prepare himself. And he slammed into the bathroom door. Guess what happened? He broke his nose. <laughs> well, you guys really don't have much of a sense of humor here. And now you knows the rest of the story. <laughs> Next year, My topic will be this book, Bluff Your Way in Economics. Thank you very much.